Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I'm joined by guest John Strohmeyer. John, welcome to the show. Hey, John. Or Jonathan, how are you? <laughs> Good. You said my name and I was like, no, Let's see, where do we start? Why don't we start here? Could you tell folks a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is John Strohmeyer. I am the proprietor of Strohmeyer Law in Houston, Texas. We are a law firm and we guide our clients through the maze of estate planning, probate, and tax law to help them leave no unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, I ha my secret power is that I worked for the Four Seasons for four years between college and law school. So I have all sorts of very strong opinions about what client service means for professionals. Awesome. That is really interesting. And I... We, we met in person recently and you gave me your card, which made me laugh. Uh, if I remember correctly, it says death and taxes handled. <laughs> Correct. It also has a, a skull and a pile of gold coins. <laughs> I love it. So good. Um, okay. So lawyers historically are uh, it, almost synonymous with hourly billing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you bill your clients now? Or let's just start here. Do you bill by the hour at all now? I have a handful of clients, and by a handful, I mean probably two or three out of more than 100 active clients right now mm -hmm. that are on hourly billing, and they are just holdovers from, you know, doing the old way. The old They're ways. matters that just haven't run, you know, haven't run their course, and so, you know, don't, I didn't want to change them mid uh, mid course. We just kind of leave it where it is, but honestly, at this point, I didn't like sending out bills and it, mostly it's a, these people have been good to me. Let's just kind of see them through to the end because mo in, in most cases, those remaining hourly clients, it's just kind of little cleanup, touch up work here and there. There's not a whole lot of heavy lifting for them anymore. Right. Okay. When, when did you, or did, when you first started, did you build hourly across the board or were you kind of like uh, at the beginning, it was just something you did once in a while? When I started this firm, which was April of 2018, I was doing good chunks of things on flat fee. So as a, as a person who does estate planning, so wills, trusts, things like that, I the firm I had left was all hourly billing. And that was one of the reasons I was leaving. Mm -hmm. But part of the reason I wanted to leave was so that I could start doing flat fee because I knew how much time I wasted tracking my time and how much time you know, spent, or wasted reviewing bills and then you hit send on a bill and you want to go hide under somebody else's desk. So, you know, when, when the inevitable blow up happens from some client who wasn't expecting a bill with a comma in it, mm -hmm. uh, comes back and just, I knew that was, I knew that was the way, at least for the planning clients. And since then, the, the one that gets the most pushback from my friends who are lawyers doing similar work is really the probate work. So the cleanup when somebody has died going to court doing all of that work they just don't understand like how can you do it and the answer is well you just do <laughs> you make a choice and you go with it you know burn the ships and we have not done anything hourly in a while got it so let's talk a little bit about your experience of hourly at the previous firm so what uh we don't have to go into too much detail but um just to lay it out for people. What was your experience other than hiding under people's desks? That's a classic <laughs> one. Uh, did you notice that hourly billing affected the behavior of the other lawyers or the partners or that? Uh, what were some other things, good or bad, about hourly billing in your experience there? Uh, I will. There was not very much that I really liked about hourly billing. Uh, obviously when you've got those big crazy projects where you don't know what it's going to look like and you're just going and going and going, you know, digging and revising or the client makes changes and then they, they want to tweak things again. Hmm. Obviously it correct hourly billing more correctly responds to that. But for most things, it really, you know, it undermines your value because if I know how to do something better or faster, then why would, you know, why would I ever want to do it faster? It takes money out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. I mean, and even thinking about how I entered my time, I had started using text expander while I was still at that last firm. And so it, you know, it, you type in the right code on your computer, then it shoots out 
you know, whatever text you want. So I knew if, you know, if I type, typed in pound sign TXT, then that was my standard time entry where I would say, you know, phone call with blank to discuss and then the 15 words that covered just about any phone call i would have had so i could you know just delete out the words that didn't matter and type in their name mm -hmm. that was yeah, that was faster but the the partners just never understood they could never wrap their heads around hey you know like we don't get it why aren't you handwriting your time entries giving your daily handwritten notes to your assistant so she can type them up hand you back a printout of what you've done so you can mark that up and hand that back to her <laughs> because inevitably she's you know she's not going to be able to read my just trash handwriting you know they, they just couldn't see it well my god how could you do it and, you know you shouldn't be doing the typing anyway because that's a waste of your time really i wasn't doing the typing but it just cut out so much work that you know they just did not see how that would ever make sense and you know, like when, when it's not in your interest to see how getting way faster at something will work, why, why would they want, why should I expect them to understand that? Yeah. I used to do workflow systems uh, back in the olden days, uh, internal workflow systems for people. And you, it was, you just never get lawyers as clients because they're, they're like, why am I going to spend 50 to a hundred thousand dollars to streamline our work? Like, why would we do that? It doesn't even make sense to them and, and yeah oh no i just saying like ultimately you know the, the way i run my firm now it's better that i get to help more people i you know sure we're we're not charging crazy amounts because we're not incentivized to take more time but we do very well and again we're able to help more people which is really the, you know the purpose of doing this it's not just um it's not just we're not in the business of making a profit. We're in the business of helping our clients get this done. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we do it at, you know, prices and ways of doing things so that they get more out of it? We, you know, we can help more people. Right. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So what, was there a particular moment where you, you're just like, I have to go, I have to leave and do this on my own. Was there an inciting incident or was it just like, Eh, it's a long time coming. Might as well do it now. It happened. It, it was August 13th or so, 2017. My wife and I had been in Mexico City with some friends and they, the, everyone there owned their own business, really, except for me. And just kind of talking through them, I was like, you know, I am not as happy as I should be considering, you know, the amount of work I bring in for myself, seeing that the path forward in a law firm was going to be that I was tied to these older gentlemen who knew what they were doing, but I was going to be hamstrung with doing things their way for the foreseeable future. And that's when it really was, it is time to go. And sure, so that it was on that trip that I was like, this is it. I'm jumping, you know, it's going to be, I'm going to need a couple months to go. And that couple months ended up getting pushed from August, 2017 to April, 2018, primarily because Hurricane Harvey hit Houston about 10 days after we got home. Mm. So I decided to, you know, bide my time, do work as hard as I could for the the guys who were there because, you know, localized depression here in Houston for a few months. Right. And so I wanted to, you know, kind of take care of things. I didn't want to leave them in a lurch at all. Right. And right. then go. Right. Okay. And so when you went solo, it was uh, tell us what that was like. How did you what what were the clients you had? Were you just to total cold start, or were you able to bring some clients from the firm? Did you work something out with the partners, or or what? What happened there in terms of like lead generation, first clients? Um, when I left, there were a few clients who came with me. Again, that one of them was an estate administration, so that one was still hourly. Mm -hmm. There were a few other little projects that I was able to bring with me that helped me get my start. But I also knew that, you know, my last year at that firm, I brought in more than enough money to, you know, fund my salary directly. Obviously, you know, running and running a new business, it wasn't going to be the same because I'd have to pay for all those things that had luckily been included and taken out before I'd left. Right. But that was enough confidence to say, oh, look, if, you know, if I was bringing in this much money before, it's not going to all evaporate. In fact, I'll probably do better. And yeah, that first year, um, I did a little bit worse than I would have done or than I'd brought in the year before. Mm -hmm. 
but it's grown pretty steadily since then. And, you know, at this point, I think we've more than quadrupled over that first year. And, you know, I, I was a true solo when I started. I now have six people who work for me. So, mm. yeah, it, it, it has been the right decision. Cool. Great. Glad to hear it. Okay. So in terms, when you hung out the shingle, with the exception of the clients that you brought over, what were your initial offerings? What were the, how did you package up your expertise for sale to new clients? So the, the nice thing about what I've always done is in the 13 plus years I've been practicing, every time I've moved, it's still been doing the same sort of work. I haven't strayed, you know, I don't do any sort of litigation. I have no plans on starting that. It's always been planning and probate and tax work around that. So when I jumped, I, you know, I, I was already offering the same sort of stuff I had been offering before, but my incentives were now much more, how do I make this fast and easy, easy for me so I can get it done? And, you know, I, I'd been experimenting the last year or so I was at the firm with doing flat fees. So I had some experience with that, but I knew, you know, like the, the problem with what I do, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of the work, the firms I'd worked for started with we're going to do effectively a one to two hour meeting for free you know dog and pony show look at all all the brilliance we can shower upon you <laughs> for free and hope you call us back that was one of the things i think i did i continued doing that for about a year or so before i realized this is really a loser for me and i have to start charging for those meetings mm -hmm. and i did and it that was something that you know lowered the stress level on those meetings because I knew I'm going to have a chance to talk to these people, even if they don't come back and hire me for the rest of the work. At least I got something out of that meeting. It wasn't totally wasted, mm -hmm. you know, a total freebie for them. Right. And if it does work, then great. They've got to, you know, it's a lot easier to write me a bigger check after they've talked to me for an hour and a half or two hours than a lot of times I was getting the, the phone calls where, hey, we've got this and this and this, what'll it cost? And I have to say, you know, a one-off here, I think you're going to end up here. And then they say, well, thanks, but no thanks. That's way out of our budget. If I had a chance to talk to them for an hour and a half, it's a lot easier to sell into that bigger number mm -hmm. because they're much more invested. Yes, for sure. Okay, when, when you're contacted by a person like that, so a prospect, and you explain how you work, uh, is it, What's their reaction? Is it surprising? Are they glad to hear it? Are they, do they expect it to be hourly? Like what, what is, what are some of their expectations and how do you address any, any problems? Right. So at this point, I'm generally not talking to clients more than a 15 minute confirmation call. I have an intake staff that if somebody calls the main line says we want to do estate planning, they talk, they then get immediately transferred to the intake staff who will get all the background and explain some of this. If they then have questions about how we work, I'll, you know, 15 minute call with me just to confirm, you know, I'm a live human. I'm really here. I do know what, <laughs> know what I'm doing. Uh -huh. And I'll explain, yeah, we, we do flat fees because it's easier for everyone. Mostly people are pretty relieved by it. The, you know, it does still take a little bit of explaining to do, you know, we're going to charge you for an initial consult and then the prices are going to range from, you know, this to this. I've tried it going both ways of here's the initial consult and then here's the prices we expect without that initial consult fee. I've learned it just, it works better for me and my clients to say, this is the initial consult fee. It gets applied to the numbers I'm going to tell you next. And so you're not, you know, it's not the 875 plus it's this including, which includes the 875. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's cool. That's an interesting incentive. So it's like you, you, it's a probably a big qualifier for serious buyers. It feels like buyers is the wrong word, but, uh, but yeah, so like somebody comes along and it's the, the initial consultations, $875. Is that what you're saying? Right. And, and that gets applied to any whatever the future purchase is if they choose to move forward right and i mean you know it's it could be 870 you can describe it either way 875 plus something else or your total cost will be this which includes your initial you know due diligence fee of 875 
Mm-hmm. Is that what you call it? The due diligence? Uh, now, uh, we, we, I call it the estate planning strategy session. Got it. So we're, you know, we're sitting down for an hour and a half or two hours. We do, we dig around on you to see what we can find online. We also want to make sure that we're getting information from you so that, you know, you don't want to waste my time or your time in that meeting with me saying, well, where do you have all your bank accounts? Is, <laughs> are you sure this is all of them? I'd rather use it as working time with me, you know, Mm -hmm. same way that you don't expect the doctor to take your temperature or your blood pressure. And, you know, he could do it perfectly fine. But if the nurse comes in and he's taking your temperature, that's more attuned. And so for me, I have my staff getting that basic asset information, confirming things Mm -hmm. before they walk in so that I don't have to spend my time doing that. Interesting. So it sounds like it sounds like a very it, it, is it similarly structured. So at the when you did work like this, or maybe not you, but someone else at the previous firm, uh, did they have such a smooth structure or like a framework no. to work with? No, right? They just be like, okay, meters running. What you got? Right. I mean, it, it was a combination of other things that I've just kind of picked up and realized. Oh, this is easier. So one of the things that pretty much every firm I've worked at did was, here's a nine page questionnaire, please fill this out before you show up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just asking for all this information. I still want that information, but I don't send people a questionnaire. Uh, we we have a version of this in type form for, for certain folks if they want to do it online. Mm-hmm. But really, I'm paying for staff to call and just draw out the information from people on the phone. It's faster. You know, I don't need to the penny values. I need to know roughly how big is your financial pie and how big are each of those slices? Mm -hmm. You know, most everybody, you know, right now you don't have to go through this, but you've got a really good idea of what, you know, where all of your accounts are and roughly what's in them. You know, even if the stock market took a major chunk out of it, it's not an order of magnitude off. <laughs> right, right. Like, that's all I really need to know, because at least we know where things are going. And if I can walk into that meeting and say, all right, we knew you had an account at Chase and another one at Wells Fargo, and you've got your brokerage account with Merrill Lynch, and you've got the 401k at principal. Is there anything else? Like, when you start them with that, it's a lot easier for them to then say, oh, well, you forgot this, or we said this, and we actually verified it. And it just kind of makes it so much easier for people if you're presenting it and drawing it out in an easy way instead of saying, I need you to do this bit of homework. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And making things easier for everyone is in your financial interest because, right, right, because, but it wouldn't be if you were charging for your time. Okay. So what about, what about, uh, I'm curious about uh, niching. So like when people come to you and you get this sort of like, picture of their financial situation is there like a gigantic range of people that you're attracting or is it a narrow band that is either on purpose or just organically happen that way like how different are your clients uh the so the clients that i end up working with generally are in the 5 million to 75 million range so i'm necessarily targeting and pricing accordingly for folks in that range Part of what we do for client education, though, is we put things on YouTube as here are the explainer videos, you know, dear clients, here's the homework. If you can review this before our initial meeting, you know, have some of these ideas and words floating around in your head, Mm -hmm. it'll go faster. Uh, Yeah. Once I started sending the the seven page, here's the description of everything to clients beforehand, I I ended up cutting an hour off that initial meeting. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even if I were billing for it, you know, having a two and a half to a three hour meeting where it's mostly me lecturing clients. And that's what those meetings were. Mm. Nobody likes that. Like <laughs> I didn't like being there and saying, when you have an executor, this is the person who's going to do blah, blah. <laughs> and, and like, and I'm sure the client, you know, is, I can do my best to be entertaining, but after a while, like, you would like to do something else. Mm. But if I, you know, at this point we're sending out the homework and we call it homework, like, please do this. We're explaining, you know, explaining very, Explicitly, you can shave an hour off of this. We'll have either version of the meeting, but most people prefer the shorter version. And then it's hyperlinked to YouTube. So if I, you know, when we say 
the executor does this. There's a video of me explaining what the executor does, or this is what a power of appointment is, or this is the power of attorney, just so they can see it in a few different ways. And if they can self-help with a freely available resource, that's great. Uh, they, they're they better educated because it's on YouTube. You know, again, we're getting more organic traffic that shows up. Not everybody is within the the broad range of clients that I'm willing to deal with. So we've ended up creating a smaller product where I'm not doing the work anymore mm -hmm. on that. My associate attorney takes care of the clients. We're you know speeding things up at a price that is intentionally not premium expert prices for working with me. Mm -hmm. It's something that's meant to be competitive with a legal zoom or a will and trust.com where it is a lower price, but these are people who picked up the phone and called us. They wanted, you know, they were, they were ready to hire an attorney. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to do it on legal zoom. And I don't see a reason, you know, basically I just got tired of telling people I'm too expensive or they were telling me I was too expensive. So we came up with an option that fits for them. Mm. So that's really interesting. So you, you detected a demand mm -hmm. that you couldn't serve in a way that that mapped your cost, price, and value in the appropriate order. So like so like they had a vet there's a value to them, but it was lower than your cost. So you're like, well, we we can't we can't work together. So you were like, all right, let's get innovative here and come up with something that is lower cost to us so that the cost is lower than the value and we can set a price somewhere in between those two numbers uh, in a way that everybody's happy with. Exactly. Right. It, I didn't want those fish getting away. I mean, we, we obviously caught the net, caught them in the net. Mm -hmm. So let's make the net a little more refined. And you know, like the, the clients who work with just my associate, she still benefits. She can ask me all the questions she wants. It's just not, you know, I'm, I'm overpowered for these folks. Mm hmm because they don't need what I can bring to it, mm -hmm. but they still need some help. They want to make sure that they've got the things that are going to work for them and their family. Right. You know, the, the other side benefit is I get, you know, low risk training clients for my associate. You know, she's the one in charge. She's the face of the franchise as far as those clients are concerned. Right. But it's not, you know, it's not a $15 million client where she's going to get overwhelmed as she tries to learn with that, like she'll be working with me on those clients. Mm -hmm. And that's great. She can kind of learn by doing there. But the smaller clients, these are people, well, you know, it's subsidizing my practice as we get help more people. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're here to help them. We're not just saying go away. It's look, you know, you don't need everything we can offer. We've got this version that is more tailored to what you need. Mm -hmm. That's great. Do you see yourself extending that product ladder even lower into maybe, I'm, I'm not saying this would be a good idea, I'm just curious, uh, into something that's maybe a DIY thing that doesn't involve your associate at all? Not, I guess I guess that's kind of getting into direct legal Zoom territory though, isn't it? It, it is, and I go back and forth on it. it you know, <laughs> there's so many other things I can do that I, I've, I've mapped out the, here's the DIY course for you kind of point people back and say, look, if you want to do your own documents, here's legal zoom or will and trust, mm -hmm. and you pay 75 or hundred or whatever it is to have access to my course. So I, I will teach you the questions to ask. God, that would be so interesting for you to create a training course for someone to use on someone else's platform. Right. So that is really interesting because I'm, I'm like imagining myself we had a, a a situation recently where I, I needed to call my lawyer um, because it was one of those I don't know what I don't know situations, like a, right. a, a major purchase, a commercial real estate type of thing that I just n no experience, don't know anybody that's done it, nothing, and nothing. So I was like, well, let me just like call Joe at least. And, um, and one of the things that needed to be done was to create an S corp at some point, and I was like, well that's how I'm currently set up. I understand how it works. I don't remember how they did it. I didn't really, I wasn't really involved, but maybe I could just go to one of these like legal sites. And as soon as I went to one, I was like, no way am I doing this? Right. There's no way because it felt like rightly or wrongly, it felt like the risk was very high of e even of me just doing something wrong. 
and it, it would have been somewhat attractive to me to, to like have, you know, I don't know if you had some channel on YouTube or someone had some chance, someone I trusted had a channel on YouTube. It was like, or, or a paid course. Like I would have paid 500 bucks for that in a second or something like that. If I trusted it, you know, and then it'd go do the legal zoom thing again, not pushing that direction. It's just more of a fun thing to think about. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a, a novel concept. But yeah, it, the, the thing, the way I think about what you're talking about is you don't hire me to fill out the forms or to necessarily draft a will for you. You know, you can go online, legal zoom will draft it for you for, you know, basically nothing. You can Google around, you can find the forms. You know, I don't have any special access to forms. In a lot of cases, we're starting with exactly what came from the Texas legislature. Mm -hmm. The big thing you're paying me for is to be able to see around the corners that you can't see and know, look, you know, the corner's coming up. I know that the, the monster that's around that corner is going to look like this. So we're going to protect you from that this way. Yeah. And that, you know, that's the value that I'm bringing. And jumping back into pricing, yes, I do set fixed fees for clients, but it's not all earned at the end. We end up saying, well, look, you're going to pay for total cost was a thousand dollars and it's not, it's more than that, but we break it up into four chunks, you know, call it a hundred dollars for the, the initial consult. Then of the next thousand dollars, about 70 of it goes for our recommendation. You know, the, the thinking work, not mm -hmm. putting pen to paper, but saying, based on our meeting with you, this is what we think you should do. Mm -hmm. And intentionally front loading the fees on us doing the thinking and making a recommendation. When we then get to the drafting, that is the, one of the smallest charges we have. Mm -hmm. And with the numbers I just made up, uh, conceptually, it's more like me charging 50 out of that 100 for us to produce documents. Now, if you look at the time involved, that's where we're spending a lot of our time. Mm -hmm. But I don't want clients think thinking and valuing drafting that much. Right. And since they don't know, I mean, why, why would they? By me intentionally depressing the value on that, because that's the lowest value piece of it, even though it's the execution portion. Mm -hmm. I'm saying like, this is the part that matters the less. I don't want you to look at the value of me drafting and saying, I hired you to draft. It's no, look at the value on our engagement letter. Most of the value is on my thinking. And then we get, you know, whatever, I've forgotten how I've broken things up, but, you know, roughly another 10% of, of our total fee comes from when they sign the document. So we, you know, our our job is to make sure you get done. We it incentivizes us to stay in touch with you until you actually sign the documents. Mm, but again, cool. you know, as the expert, you're paying me to think, not to swing the hammer. Right. Yeah. The framing is great. I love it. Speaking of swinging the hammer, the framing. Okay. So, is there? Do you see uh, something farther up the product ladder? So we we're sort of like experimenting with ideas that might be farther down the product ladder. But is there? Mm -hmm. uh, are you attracting? Um, a type of lead for whom maybe even what your whatever your current top option is are you attracting any leads that you that you're like um we're not really the best fit for this it's too bad because it probably make a great client but we don't have something to offer them so we'll refer them to someone who handles this kind of client uh, is is there any do you see demand at the high end that you are perhaps thinking of ways to address it's yes and no there are certain things right now can conceptually I draw a line at around people who have $100 million, and that's mostly because it's not that they don't need more work. It's I'm not really geared in this firm to handle them. Mm -hmm. I've worked on those clients before. They have some interesting work to be done. Mm -hmm. The problem is I, as the attorney, I'm not talking directly to my client anymore. I'm talking to the lawyer for the family office who maybe met with the client two yeah, or three weeks. That's ago. what I was going to ask you about, right? Like, aren't, isn't that what, a, don't family offices kind of do what you do or not really? Not really. So, I mean, there's parts of what I do that can get handled by a family office and each family office, when it's an actual family office and not, you know, you'll, it's possible there are lots of fractional family offices out there. They're still, for the most part, they're going and they have an outside law firm that is doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, the family office itself primarily is responsible for 
owning and managing the assets of that family. Mm-hmm. They may do, you know, they may have an internal lawyer who's looking at, well, you know, operational agreements. Do we have everything in place? Do we have employment agreements for staff? That mm-hmm. sort of thing. But they may not. I mean, it's it's probably a. I'm not seeing it because the family offices I worked with outsourced it. They're probably our family offices that do all of it internally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you wouldn't see those because they're not out in the market looking for a lawyer. Exactly. That's so interesting. All right. So what is what? Uh, OK, I'm going to ask a question, but I also want to caveat the question. So what <laughs> does a for your situation, uh, the kind of clients that that you've got mapped out as your ideal buyers. What does growth look like? How would you measure growth or call it even just financial health of your business? Like, how do you track that? What are you, what's your strategy or what are your objectives in the strategy for maybe the next three years? Like, are you, if, if, if you can share that. Sure. Uh, just rough numbers on a week to week basis. We're reconciling our accounts every week and I have a retainer account Every client pays up front. You know, this is still a small business. I need to be able to make payroll. And so if clients don't pay up front, we're not going to do work for them. It just, mm-hmm. I can't take, or initially I couldn't take the risk on people not paying me. At this point, it's ground in enough that, and I'm like, I just don't want to chase people yeah. for money. Right. You know, credit is earned. We accept credit cards. So if you don't have the cash right now for us, we're happy to take a credit card and you can, you know, negotiate terms with Amex or MasterCard. Yeah. But you're not going to be their bank. No. And and like, look, banks are specialized in determining credit health. I am not. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm far too trusting. Nice way to put it. Yeah. I'm Um, like, <laughs> I'm a specialist in certain things and, and credit worthiness is not it. <laughs> uh, okay. So well, I, I can't, uh, you mentioned retainers. All right. So mm-hmm. famously, I, I kind of hate the word retainer because it, people interpret it to be lots of different things. And the, uh, one of the things that people always say, and maybe this is out of um, just a lack of knowledge, but a lot of people say, you know, they think of like, oh, like a lawyer. So you are a lawyer. And I are a lawyer. Yes, yep. you are. So what, in your definition, what's a retainer in general, and that broadly speaking, and then if you could describe what, how you run your retainers or like what kind of client needs or ongoing sort of assistance like that? Uh, so for me, reta- retainers are particularly defined by the state bar of Texas. I have a separate account. We call it IOLTA for interest on lawyers trust accounts. So it can retainers, retainer payments go into our trust account. The money belongs to the client. They can ask for that money back as long, you know, as long as we haven't earned it, hmm. it's their money. We can refund it if we need to. Uh, while it is in that account, you know, I, I have to keep it balanced to the penny. I can lose my license if it is off. Wait, so like, let me pump the brakes here for a second. Sure. You said that the the bar specifically defines what a retainer is. Yes, uh, it's it is a con- um, part of the conditions of me having my license are if I'm going to have this trust account for retainer payments, mm-hmm. there are rules and the bar can come in it and audit it whenever they want. Mm-hmm. What what is their definition of a retainer? I, because the 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 layman's definition that I've come across is that it's prepayment for a bucket of hours. Right. And so this it's it's prepayment for services. Okay. Now, because I'm doing things on a flat fee basis and we have, you know, benchmarks, like when we provide when we are done with our initial meeting, mm-hmm. that money comes out of the trust account. When we provide you with that initial recommendation, the money can be moved from the trust account into our income account. Okay. So it's like a escrow basically. Right. That, uh, that That's a perfectly good way of putting it. Like it's, it's not our money, but I am responsible for it. And right. You're responsible for it. And also they don't have it. I mean, they could get it back, but you don't have to chase them for it because you know where it is and you've got control over it. 100%. And severe yeah. penalties for you for any shenanigans. Right. And, you know, I look at that account and I see, you know, one of the metrics I keep around is I know how much money I would like to make every week, you know, just 
how much money would I like to have pulled out of that account? Mm -hmm. And I divide that number into the total value of the account. It's not a guarantee we're actually going to do that, mm -hmm. but it does provide a certain level of you know sanity and calming influence to look and see, <laughs> oh, we've got about two or three months worth of work in there yep. right now. And so my jo you know, my job is to make sure every week we're pulling out enough money. You know, we're we are doing the work, and it really helps me see. Well, you know, like we're producing paper every week, and how how do we know if we're doing our job? Well, mm -hmm. I know, you know, I, I've got my target metric of what that dollar amount is every mm -hmm. week to mm -hmm. not only to make money, but also you know, can I make payroll twice a month? I know I need to be pulling out this mm -hmm. many dollars before I start getting in trouble. And it's it's much easier to look at it at the beginning of the week and say, all right, well, we know we're gonna have one initial recommendation that's gonna cover us for a good chunk of this week. And then we've got three people signing, two initial meetings. We're gonna go have a hearing on this. That's probably gonna be it. Next week, uh, we're gonna file a few applications for probate. We're gonna do blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And looking down, we've got Thanksgiving in a few weeks. That's going to be a slower week. So right now I'm trying to push out as much work as possible, knowing we're going to have a slow, slow week uh, that last full week of uh, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So you, so basically, just to put it in layman's terms, you you look at the the how much is there, and you're like, okay, we need to do this much work so we can legitimately withdraw this much money, right? And how you know, but it's not this much. It's not work defined in how many hours are spent. It's work in, it's more like milestones that you've reached. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so my team knows, you know, there's, there's a priority of things that need to get done. You know, we want to make sure that, look, our initial meetings, those initial strategy sessions, the homework, the, and that has to go out to clients. We're making sure that gets out first because we want people thinking as much as possible about this. Mm -hmm. Kind of next priority after that, we want to make sure the initial recommendations get out. Just turning those around as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. From there, you know, it, it's getting into drafting documents, making sure that certain things get done first, or just just to make sure they know. Look, even if I'm not around and they they think they've run out of things to do, or they have five things in front of them. What needs to get done first? Mm -hmm. They can, you know, they self-help on what to do next. Right. Yeah. It's like automatically prioritized. Right. Cool. So what, so, so does everything, I'm curious if that is just for, well, what's the purpose that someone would hire you on retainer? So the, to me, there's like two different things going on here. It sounds like, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like all of your payments since they're upfront and, and that is on let's just say unusual for your industry, then does all of your revenue go into this trust first? Just about all of our revenue is going into the trust account. So yeah. that is, a, you know, we have a few things that come in occasionally that aren't, but for the most part, we're, we're not doing any work until we have money in the bank for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so yes, yeah, so almost all of it is on retainer and it's not, you know, it, it's for specific amounts. I'm not asking for, you know, it's $10,000. And when we use it up, we'll ask for more. It's we're asking for $10,000 because that's exactly what you're going to charge. You're going to pay us once and then we don't have to talk about money again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the other thing that I think a lot of people imagine when they think about retainers is that it's like a recurring subscription versus these one-time things that you're also referring to as a retainer because it's an upfront payment. So what do you have a subscription product? When, and when you said retainer before, I assumed a, a subscription, but do you have some kind of offering that is a subscription where it's like every yes. month? Okay, so let's talk about that. But you yes. don't call it a retainer. No, I mean, we. I do have to use the, um, we, we still have to call it a retainer because that's what the bar says. And so speaking the same language. Okay. But, you know, whatever you want to call money people give us, for work we haven't done yet. Yeah. And I do have clients on subscription. Those mm -hmm. also get paid up front and then we, you know, keep track of exactly how much money is in there so that clients know like you you've got this much money left in the hopper or which translates into this number of months. Okay. So they make one big payment for say a year or something. Right. And and you just take out the portion of it 
based on whatever, like really whatever the bar is going to think is copacetic. So no, yeah, I mean, we, we've specifically agreed. Um, so I've got clients on a variety of payments per month. I've had them as high as three grand a month mm -hmm. and they go down to whatever, I think it's whatever 750 divided by 12 is. <laughs> uh, but the idea is, you know, we just schedule it out and we know on the first of the month, we're going to run an invoice in our matter system and it's going to say take out $62.50 or whatever that number should be. Yeah. And we put that, take that out of the trust account and we put that in the income account. Mm -hmm. okay. And the clients who have bigger payments, those are usually you know negotiated and it it's based on the client's specific circumstances so that you know the clients who are paying $3,000 a month, they had a lot of stuff going on. And that retain or that retainer, that subscription was a three month subscription. We knew we were going to be doing a lot of stuff for them, mm -hmm. but I also, you know, was conscious of the fact I'm asking for 3000 American dollars every month. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at how far we get at the end of three months. And we're going to talk again about this. And when we were done with those three months, we cut the price in half and doubled the time. So mm -hmm. it went from 3000 a month to 1500 a month for six months. As a way of saying like, hey, you know, we're not fully done because there were other projects and, you know, we're almost done with that version of it. I anticipate saying, look, you know, we're even better next year. It's going, it's going to keep going down because we want to keep you around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's a, it's a dance and not, you know, I know for this family, they're going to have less for me to do next year, but right. not nothing. Right. I see. So, okay. I it's, the terminology is fascinating because you're forced to use words in a way that I wouldn't normally to speak the same language as the bar, because I, what you're talking about, I would call projects with right. a payment plan. It's like, it, like to me, a subscription is like, you have permission to run my credit card every month for this agreed upon amount. And it sounds like a lawyer would be prevented from ever doing like a Netflix kind of subscription. Is that? No, I mean, the, what I'm calling my subscription really is you know, if you have something to do, you know, this the family I'm working with right now, it, you know, th they came back and they were going through a sale and they looked around and they realized they didn't have an operating agreement for one of their companies. Like, oh, that's included. Don't worry. And we you know, pulled together an agreement for them mm -hmm. so that they had that. We weren't going to charge them any more for it. It really is a here's the buffet of everything we do. If we do it, we'll do it. Got it. So, and if yeah, we don't do it, then... You know, if, if I'm not, you know, the way I think about it is if I'm not top three in the city in whatever they're asking for, my job is to get them to somebody who is mm -hmm. so that they get a much better result. Like, I don't, I don't know how to go through an adoption and I'm not going to bumble through that <laughs> right. for somebody. Right. So that's your scope. Your scope is I'll do anything that I'm uh, sort of recognized expert at. If, if I'm not, I'm not going to, it's not covered, but right. for, for your needs in these areas, you're covered. So that's very much like the kind of Ron Baker definition. Yes. Of a, yeah. It's just like it, if for like a concierge doctor kind of thing. It's like, it's like he's not going to do, my, my doctor's not going to do hand surgery, but I have an unlimited access to, for any questions or text, you know, photos of a rash or whatever, you know, it's like, what is this? You know, do I need to come in? Uh, I feel funny. Should I come in? You know, and, and it's, it's just totally unlimited to the, you know, to the boundary lines of his area of expertise. I got it. Okay. So that's, that's an interesting, uh, you've got my gears turning because that is sort of the lines the words are getting kind of blurry when you piece apart the types of, the types of offer, uh, the components of, uh, of what I would call like an advisory retainer. Yours is a, yours is sort of a mix of different things. Right. It's, um, I'm kind of like the 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 concierge doctor who is the you know was it a uh, general physician you know GP physician mm -hmm. in terms of if it's not in my scope of expertise so you know I'm like the cardiac surgeon who will also tell you you need to see a podiatrist or an orthopedic surgeon right like if it's within you know if you come to me with a trust or uh probate issue yes I'm going to take care of it I don't need to send you anywhere else mm -hmm. because I am you know, my, my value above the replacement lawyer is pretty high on that. Mm -hmm. But if you come in and say, I need to sue somebody or 
they're they want to file a lawsuit against me i'm getting rid of that immediately even if it is a trust and estate matter because i don't know how to deal with that mm -hmm. and right. i don't want to learn right and how how much i mean this to set their expectations you must have to have this conversation with them early so is that like do, does this uh, surprise them or cause any problems or are they just like yeah that makes total sense because it makes sense to me i'm just curious though you know if someone's about to write you uh, a check for eighteen thousand dollars to go into your trust like are they like well wait a second <laughs> how do i know <laughs> if you know you're not just going to send me to someone else does that ever really happen or not really it happens occasionally you know we will get people who say well wait a minute you're you want the money up front before before you've done anything, how do I know you're not just going to take my money and run? Well, you know, at this point, I've been in the same location for four and a half years. You can go look at my Google reviews. I'm not here to, you know, be the overnight uh, fly by night guy. Yeah. Um, in terms of, well, you know, yes, you are, at, you know, sometimes I'm asking for five digits worth of fees. What Because I asked for all of it up front, it does put me in the position to negotiate backwards from there. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, well, you know, we'll we'll bill you on this and you'll write a check every time. And if you don't write that check, then I'm saying, please, please. Uh had an initial meeting with someone this week. And he said, well, look, you're asking for a bit of money, but because we're going to be done by year end, can we, you know, do half now and half later? Sure. That that's easy. I'm not worried about this guy having the financial wherewithal to pay, mm -hmm. but it's better for his personal cash flow if he doesn't write that check all at once yep mm -hmm. yeah it's a great thing to negotiate the, the terms like the when the payments are going to be right because even though even though it's being paid out to you on a sort of milestone basis mm -hmm. they have to write it all up front if that's you know so it's like it's gone from them but it hasn't all made its way all the way to you in some cases so right and you know the the fact that i mean i even included it in my engagement letters like the money doesn't belong to you it will earn interest but i don't get you know the, the interest does not go to me it mm -hmm. goes back to the state bar and <laughs> they you know they use it for charitable purposes but you know it, it's still your money and we're pretty explicit about saying that because it is their money if they want it back we'll give it back mm-hmm Interesting. Wild. Okay. So what's, what's next for you guys? Do you think like, do you just keep making things more efficient? Do you, uh, I don't know, add a different line of business, like moving into like adding on something to planning probate tax or, uh, yeah. Like what is it, what does it look like once if you it sounds like the machine is fairly well, well oiled at this point. Right. The machine's pretty good. I'm, there are little like associated areas that I can get better at, but I wouldn't want to start competing with you know any of my referral sources. So I'm not going to take on litigation stuff. When it comes to things like business planning with clients, there are people who are way better at it than I am. But it doesn't mean I can't develop my skills for you know a family that has an agreement in place and they need to modify it. That's something... Hey, we can probably keep that here. No need to send send them out to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I don't really envision expanding those sorts of lines. In terms of what we can do, well, you know, there's plenty of work here. So how do I make the pool bigger, and how do I reach more people? Yep, that's my bit. You know, like I'm. It's it's honestly somewhat shocking every time I hear, yeah, that, you know, I'm a financial advisor or I'm a CPA and I don't know anybody to send this sort of work to. Hmm. And part of that is just the way the legal market has worked um, over the last decade or so. The, the big firms that were doing this work have gotten out of it. The smaller firms still do it, but they're not training as many people. So there, there is a decreasing number of people with my skill level and sophistication Mm -hmm. that can do this and you know the other side is i have fun in what i do uh mm -hmm. you know you got the the card with the skull and the pile yeah. of gold coins yeah. that helps me stand out there are plenty of clients who have you know we, we've gotten uh hired and they said somewhere along the line or you know either before the at the first call or after they hired us we weren't sure if it was going to be you or somebody else then we were poking around on your website and we saw that you've listed your dogs as your employees and we decided you're the right guy for us and that's perfect like that's exactly <laughs> what i want to hear the people uh you know the 
the people I bring in with that, I'm probably rejecting without ever having talked to them, the same number of people who look at that and say, this guy is not serious if he is putting, you know, if he's listed his dogs as employees. Right. And that is wonderful because those sort of people, I'm happy for them to go somewhere else because I wasn't going to be able to take care of them in the way that they were. You know, they, they'd they probably expect me to show up in a suit and tie every time. And oh little God, you know, I just, I didn't start this firm to keep on doing things the same way. <laughs> yeah. So do you think, you know, adding associates is in your future or are you just sort of happy with the, the profit level and, you know, and it's, and it's more than enough for your lifestyle? I'm just sort of curious, like, if you think that you want to create more leverage or if you're like, no, this is great. I could do this for 10 years and be happy as a clam and maybe, maybe sell the business to the person who's the associate now and right off in the sunset. Um, I so I already have one associate, another one, another lawyer I expect to start next summer. So I it, it is growing. Um, I have a number in my mind of where I'm, you know, the the was it the Rockefeller habit B hag of this is this is crazy. So I'm working towards that. The next kind of really big hire would be can I kind of grab somebody away from a competitor who is you know, skill level that matches mine. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the only expert in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, that right. That's really the one I don't, I own a hundred percent of the firm. I really like being able to make decisions without asking anybody else for permission. Right. And, you know, like I had having a silly idea and saying, you know, we're just going to do this because that's the sort of firm I want to build. You know, like, I live in Houston. The Astros are one of my favorite teams. They just won the World Series. And what we did, uh, one of my, my associate attorney is a lifelong Phillies fan. For the entire week of the World Series and you know, for the next week or so, we've taken her name completely off the website and just replaced it with nameless Phillies fan. <laughs> you know, we did it with her permission uh, because she, I mean, she got the joke. She understands why it's funny and she knows that it is not mean spirited. <laughs> Um, and then this uh, a couple of days ago, we photoshopped, you know, Astros hats on all of us except for Kimmy. Kimmy got a Phillies hat. I sent it to one of my referral sources. And I mean, and we put it on the dog's photos as well. She's like, you know, thank you for doing it. You know, I'm not sending work to anybody else. You get all of it from now on. It's like <laughs> that that wasn't what I was looking for. But the freedom to be able to do that. Yeah. Um. Like this is why, why would I, you know, you know, for better or for worse, I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon. Right. I still enjoy what I do. A lot of lawyers have kind of soul sucking jobs where, you know, you're going to court and fighting all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. This is a job where we talk to people about what do they want to do? How, how can we avoid messes for them down the line? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, sm the minor tweaks we can do now to avoid the major course alterations when something happens and you weren't ready for it that, like, right that that's what i want right well great this has been f fabulous thanks so much for being so generous with the, the inside information that you've shared with everyone today of course i mean uh, you know as a long time listener first time caller <laughs> it, it is an honor to be out here awesome well, where can people go to find out more about you maybe they need planning or probate or tax work done maybe they like the sound of all of this Sure. Uh, if you are looking for help with any sort of tax and probate and you happen to be in Texas, you can find me Strohmeyer Law or John the Lawyer on Twitter. Other than that, I, as I mentioned, I worked for the Four Seasons for a few years between college and law school. So I have all sorts of very specific thoughts on what client service means for lawyers and other professionals and i have a podcast where jonathan you were a guest on that once so uh we'll include a link or i'll send you a link so you can get that interview between the two of us absolutely great well thanks again john no thank you jonathan all right folks that's it for this week i'm jonathan stark and i hope you join me again next time for ditching hourly bye <laughs>